throw uh, that kilt widely up in the air and, and shows the dreadful turkey's head he has done previously, bless him, uh, proving that, in fact, Scotsmen don't wear anything under their kilts. Please, Jack, no. Uh, they had their first rostrum at Mizano a week ago. Uh, brilliant result for them. And um, they have qualified on the second row of the grid here. It is, of course, the famous pointed grid. So uh, the Clark Grand Prix boys are on actually the third row of the grid there, number six. That's the three-man row alongside Janssen Hopkinson and Stevie Abbott and Jamie Biggs. And then the two-man row in front of them is uh, Steinhausen and Parzer, the number eight Suzuki and Klaffenbock Harney, the number two Suzuki, the OKM machine on the left. And of course that menacing number one at the front of Steve Webster, Paul Woodhead. Um, and we are looking forward to round seven as they head off on their warm-up lap. There are only 17 outfits on the grid. And um, the reason for that is that we, we lost one of the guys, unfortunately, after an accident in training. Which uh, means that they, they weren't able to make the start. We've also lost, instantly, Brock Gray, the second of the Clark Grand Prix team. We've lost Hausenberger, who was fourth in the championship up until that point. So... Uh, Rather unfortunate for him that he's not able to make the start. Uh, Houtzenberger, he had not had a chance to go out because of technical problems in the first qualifying session. In the second qualifying session, was, which was a wet one, having had no chance to really set a respectable time, he crashed in the first turn and uh, his passenger, Waffler, was injured. So that was it, really. They were out of it, which is a great shame for, for um, Houtzenberger and Waffler because, as I say, they were lying in fourth place in the championship and of course they're not going to get any points today 55 points at the moment Steinhausen is third in the championship with 88 Klaffenbock and Harney are on 117 and the leaders and defending champions Steve Webster of course with new sidekick Paul Woodhead on 135 Steve Webster also I might have that advantage rather um, rather uh, considerably increased because Klaffenbock is still um, under investigation for illegal fuel for that Donington Park race win. If that 25 points drift off him, then he's going to fall right back into Steinhausen's clutches. But anyway, for the moment, Klaus Klaffenbach and Adolf Harney can go on, go on as Noriyuki Haga is doing, perhaps, and repeat the race win that Noriyuki Haga stuck on the second of the World Superbike races here at Valencia. I was saying that the second Clark Grand Prix outfit of Brian Gay, Pointer and Brian Gray is uh, out of action at the moment. Brian Gray is setting up a new motorcycle business back in the UK, but they will be introducing a new second team at Brands Hatch at the next round, and that's 25 year old David Morrissey with 22 year old Stuart Dunton in the chair. So in the fine old world of Dad's Army racing, it's great to get some new young blood into the Sidecar World Cup and they will be replacing Gray and Pointer at Brands Hatch. I'm talking of, of uh, the splendid and extremely fast older men of Sidecar World Cup racing, Steve Abbott was ordered to show up here, otherwise he wouldn't be allowed to compete for the rest of the year. And Steve, we didn't want you to miss Brands Hatch, so we're very relieved that uh, you did decide to, to show up. So Steve Abbott and Jamie Biggs on the uh, Greb and Sec racing outfit, which uh, you readily identify the number, th the green number three outfit. They are in fact in the starting lineup on the third row of the grid. Uh, the constant winners of uh, over in the Isle of Man at the TT, Dave Molyneux and Pete Hill. They've got their Honda Britain machine on the fourth, the third row of the grid, fourth row of the grid. I beg their pardon. Alongside. Uh, Hanks and Simons. Ian Simons taking over from the other Biggs. Phil Biggs dislocated his shoulder in that uh, awful looking crash at Hockenheim that had that race red flagged. So Ian Simmons stepping into the Yamaha outfit uh, to, to, uh, to assist that man Hanks. So Tom Hanks accompanied by Ian Simmons as the man with the red flag stands bravely in front of Steve Webster. Not many people would do that. 40-year-old world champion with his eyes set on another win. So round seven of the World Sidecar World Cup about to commence here at Valencia in Spain at the Circuito Ricardo Tormo. And Steve Webster on pole position, his great rival and the number two red outfit, the OKM outfit, Klaus Klaffenbach on the second row of the grid. And alongside him, the number eight outfit, the second of the Steinhausen raising outfits, York Steinhausen and Christian Park. Watch 
for those lights to change. Listen to those 1200cc engines howl. And, oh, Klaffenbach gets some sort of drive and goes clean off past the Arrowhead formation leader. And, in fact, Steinhausen also passes his T-Boss, but suddenly gets himself... Oh, and what happened then? Klaffenbach blacked off so early that he got swallowed up in scissor fashion by the two Steinhausen Suzuki's, Rob. Yeah, Jörg Steinhausen was uh, definitely right on the button with the brakes there, getting past Steve Webster and taking the whole shot into that turn one. And here they are, all in line astern at the moment. But uh, Steve Webster, very slow off the mark. I was watching closely as Paul Woodhead transferred the whole of his weight across the back wheel so that uh, when Steve Webster fed the clutch in and uh, let that out to get a good start. But <laughs> it just didn't work out that way because uh, the number two machine, Klaus Klaffenbach on the OK, machine just shot into the lead but then Jörg Steinhausen talking to him yesterday a dangerous glint in his eye full of beans and after his first win a couple of weekends ago and uh, he wasn't that confident about getting a race win here today his uh, thoughts were all full of Steve Webster taking the race win but Jörg Steinhausen at the moment well he's about five outfits lengths in front of the the chap that he said would uh, walk away with the win and that's Steve Webster so Jörg uh, well <laughs> lots of power underneath uh, that he's sitting on and lots of inspiration to take this race win but an excellent outbreaking maneuver into that for that second turn so Steinhausen leads the team boss well I'll just get you on he's the son of the team boss Steinhausen leads the team leader Kleffenbach's there Steve Abbott is there number 22 outfit of Tom Hanks and Ian Simmons has also made a great start and is right there in the reckoning as they come howling past us for the first time. Many thousands of cc's of screaming sidecars. Steinhausen, Webster, Klavenbock, Abbott, Hanks, fifth. Molyneux in sixth place. Van Giel, seventh. Ian Guy in eighth place in the David James Motorsports Kits Racing outfit. And Benny Janssen, a disappointing start for him. Janssen had a good position on the starting grid and the former world motocross champion has definitely slugged that one away. And uh, he's 99th place ahead of the number 40 outfit of Hegarty. An insp inspired start by uh, Steve Abbott and Jamie Biggs. Of course, on that 1,000cc Yamaha outfit, which is giving away 200cc and a considerable amount of power as well. However, at the Valencia circuit, more of a neutral effect on power output, whether it's a solo two-wheel machine or these outfit, the sidecar outfits with three wheels. And the benefit for Steve Abbott, he was telling me at Donington Park earlier in the season, oh, and the 26 machine is out of the picture. And that's Gary Smith and Tony Balaz on the uh, Team uh, ASG Suzuki. Goodbye to them. Out in the just lap one of 23 but Steve Abbott uh, a lot lighter that outfit and around this circuit with lots of well three hairpins and third and fourth gear corners uh, he'll be able to use the later braking capability of his 1000 cc MR outfit and consequently Steve Abbott threats and all about you better race at this meeting or you can't do the rest of the season and that's inspired him because he's in a very healthy fourth place at the moment at, uh, I'm impressed with the guy behind him, Tom Hanks, with a newcomer in the chair, Ian Simmons. He is really looking quick in that blue FTC Yamaha. Look at him, closing right up behind Steve Abbott through the final turn. So, uh, Tom Hanks proving that uh, there are some younger, new British um, talented boys coming through the ranks. Let's hear it for them. And Dave Molyneux there is in sixth place as Hanks tailgates Stevie Abbott down the straight, but he hasn't quite got the sheer pace to make it underneath that, uh, that uh, outfit of Steve Abbott as they go through the first turn. Klaffenbock, definitely at the moment not showing any signs of being able to truly hang on to these two silver monsters, the Olympia Reese and Steinhausen racing outfits. Fastest lap already down to Webster. Yes. Webster apparently, yeah. Rob, runs, runs a five-speed gearbox during training, a six-speed spot during the box during the racing, and sometimes gets a bit confused by them. It's because he hasn't got enough spares to run the six-speed box all the time. Well, that thing is uh, about the Suzuki, the whole engine is very, very highly stressed, whether it's the crankcases or the transmission, and including the clutch, of course. Everything is very highly stressed about that. Uh, well, not not the, the first two outfits out there, the, the uh, engines, the crankcases, that little bit too thin really for, for the power output that's put through them and so hence that will lead on to the fact that the Hayabusa engine that I'll talk about in a little while um, is being developed currently by uh, 
uh, the, the Steinhausen team. Rolf Steinhausen talking to him about that earlier on. And so Steve Webster, not just uh, tyre management, but engine and spares management as well. With not a, a bottomless pit of, of budget, then Steve Webster never been one to be wasteful and throw things away. You remember a couple of weeks, well, a week Rob, ago. Rob is a Yorkshireman. He had to change, he had to make that supreme investment for a new radiator, wasn't it? <laughs> At Monza, so that uh, they didn't have overheating problems and still reeling from having to spend that money on that. He'll forgive me for saying. Well, you mean he couldn't put that flaky stuff down it that's like sort of tea leaves that, 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 Radwell. that gels? Radwell. Yes. Oh, good old Radwell. We've all used it, haven't we? Dave Molyneux losing out there as the number 17 outfit of Benny Janssen. Trevor Hopkinson dives beneath him through the last turn. So Benny Janssen, after a disappointing start, beginning to go for it. And, of course, uh, the, the Fireblade engine uh, that... Uh, that the boy Molyneux is using is uh, not quite in as high a status tune as the one that kept not lasting longer than a lap and a half during the first part of the season. Commentator's Blight strikes again. That man Klavenbock has just set the fastest lap of the race, 144.661, just when I thought he was showing no sign of hanging onto the silver machines. He's there, right there, and uh, we've already got a yellow outfit parked up at the side of the track there. And I'm glad to see it's not the red and yellow Clark Grand Prix Muldoon and Gusman outfit, which had an awful start, an obscene start. It was in 12th place. It's now progressed through to 8th place because after getting on the rostrum for the first time at Mizano last week, they surely want to do a bit better than finish outside the top 10. So Muldoon pushing through to 8th place now with... Um, Molyneux is his next target, but he's five seconds adrift of him at the moment. And the number 12 outfit, Barry Fleury and Jane Fleury. What a shame. They were running the New Zealand for, um, husband and wife team from, who've lived for 13 years in Bristol. Uh, were uh, fielding a BMW K1200 RS powered outfit. And that's the first time BMW have featured in sidecar Grand Prix racing for something on over 20 years. Because, of course, the BMWs used to be their supreme engine unit. Talking about supreme engine units and supreme drivers, watch this man, Steve Webster, with Paul Woodhead tucked right out of sight, trying to get inside Steinhausen. But, you know, I think that victory of Steinhausen's, at, was it Hockenheim, has really proved a huge confident booster for this guy. Hi, Rob. Until you get your first race win, you can never really be sure of just how good you are as a rider or driver. And and as I say, until you get that first race win, or a phrase that, when you have got that first race win, you really begin to believe in yourself 100%. And that is the time, well, it's the end of the beginning, shall we say. You go out there, you know you can win, you know that if you've got the machine set up right, and you've got luck on your side, that you uh, can be unbeaten on, on that day. And uh, you're actually Steinhausen is case in point, he is that man, <laughs> and even though Steve Webster and Paul Woodhead showed them a wheel, or wheels should we say, Jörg Steinhausen held them off, and Steve Webster, with just on lap 4 of 23, so another 19 laps to go, uh, Steve Webster didn't want to do anything that, that would have taken them both out and on, off onto the edge of the track, and that man, Klaus Klaffenbach, your favourite man out there on track, Klaus Klaffenbach, as uh, down into the 1 minute 44s, although uh, Steve Webster, with that manoeuvre on a few corners ago, he currently being credited with the fastest lap of the race, down in a low 1 minute 44, actually 144.191. Uh, really just staying in line of stern, bags and bags of time to go later in the race to make moves uh, on that eventual hopeful race win. I seem to remember you telling me that you won your first ever race, Rob. So you knew, you obviously knew your worth very early in your career. The beginning <laughs> wasn't long in coming. Incidentally, 144.191, and the last lap of Muldoon down in eighth place was 144.2. One, one almost identical lap time just to prove how fast that Clark Grand Prix Honda is going as it closes up in the distance there on Dave Molyneux so off an awful start uh, Muldoon and Gus Gusman are beginning to uh, beginning to close in sorry Chris Gusman Chris Dipstick Gusman Stuart Angus Muldoon they're making moves as indeed is Benny Janssen now pressing that Tom Hanks outfit hard Past a slap now to Steinhausen Pass at 143.5. The guys are blitzing the non-existent lap record in their attempts to set the first target for sidecars round this uh, very new circuit here. Oh, it's early. The Clark Grand Prix squad, I beg your pardon, Rob, has got through ahead of Molyneux and Hill, so they really are making tremendous progress. And uh, the outfit that uh, didn't arrive until 3 o'clock Thursday morning, because... Um, 
had uh, been, I think, mean, after limping through the night with a uh, puncture in its uh, rear inside tyre of the trailer. So um, they did extremely, they were extremely happy after uh, after that terrific performance at Misano. No problems throughout practice, tyre problems in choosing the right compound, but uh, no problems like that for these three guys at the front. And dear old Klaus Pfaffenbrock, the more miserable he gets, the more I like him. And I think it's because uh, Harney keeps smiling grimly through it all as he tries to um, keep, keep uh, bolstering his boy's ego. Keep that uh, Klaffenbock racing outfit, OKM backed outfit, right there on the pace. Because let's face it, we need it, otherwise we'd have this silver-dominated racing all the time. Steve Abbott still holding in there strongly in fourth place. He's 3.6 seconds off the leader. But considering, what was it, Rob? Is it something like a 1,050cc? He's dropped about 150ccs on that Yamaha engine to make it stick together. So he knows he's going to be losing a bit on horsepower. Well, the three machines that were in the, were in the same frame then as we approached that uh, first hairpin, the double apex left-hander left hairpin, arguably the, the most powerful outfits in the whole championship. And certainly Steve Webster uh, with uh, his qualifying time of a 141.953, the only one out there in the 41s after the Super Bowl uh, is probably will will agree is the most powerful and certainly so far this season the most consistent uh giving away a lot of power is uh, uh steve abbott and jamie biggs but to still remain in contention almost in the same frame uh, is is excellent he's able to break that bit later even though he's not got the power of the first three able to break that little bit later into the corners and around this circuit with three hairpins and uh, really that tight left-hander onto the start finish straight he'll remain in con in uh, contention i think for for that strong fourth place throughout the race but uh, as we say only lap six of 23 bags and bags of time to go yet for more uh, surprises shall we say to unfold in front of us but Klaus Klaffenbach, he's got that watching brief in third place at the moment. Staying out of trouble, uh, Klaus Klaffenbach and Adolf Harney also on that Suzuki at 1200cc. Their qualifying time at 142.677. And he's got a, a reputation as Klaus Klaffenbach as not really wanting to show his hand as far as time's out there on the track until the race comes along as Steve Webster thinks about pulling by the side of his teammate, Jörg Steinhausen. And Klaus Klaffenbach just waiting to see if just how much work he's got to do because if these leading duo do uh, actually get to tangle then well he might just be there to, in time to inherit the first place and we know that we've already seen evidence uh, today if in earlier in the afternoon of how teammates can tangle in fact yogi toyhut was telling us how astonished he was when christian keller just came across the track and kept on coming leaving yogi nowhere to go until they shoulder charged one another going down towards the second turn <laughs> This is the Olympia recent Suzuki 1200cc monstro of, of uh, York Steinhausen. Number one, the identical outfit of Stevie Webster. And number two, look at that, the OKM outfit similarly powered as Webster Wood of Klaffenbach and Harney as Webster Wood had dipped further in, 132.288. Klaffenbach did a 143.5 on that lap. Abbott a 144.1, Janssen 144.1, Hanks 145.4 and Muldoon 143.393. Muldoon, if he hadn't hashed his start up as much, really would be right there in the frame. But uh, the Muldoon on that Clark Grand Prix outfit. There's Stuart and Chris, very, very confident for a Rostrum finish this weekend again. But uh, you've got to get out the start, boys, to do that because you've got to you've got to catch up with these big heavyweights up front. New American sponsors in and any Teledyne re relays. Very happy with the performance of the team of the, the Clark Grand Prix team in Misano and uh, negotiations, got negotiations going on for next year. So come on, boys, get yourselves in the frame. Steinhausen, Webster, Klaffenbach are the first three. Abbott, Janssen, Muldoon are fourth, fifth, and sixth. Hanks has been pushed back to seventh. Molyneux eighth. And there is the moment at which the Clark Grand Prix outfit of Muldoon and Gusman forced its way inside. A surprise, Tom Hanks and Ian Simmons just keeping his backside clear. 15 laps to go out of 23. Ian Guy, not into having such a good ride on the Kits Racing David James Motorsports outfit. Guy and Peach back in 10th place, uh, battling with Ran Gills, who is just uh, six tenths of a second in front of them in 9th, but they're half a minute down on the leaders. 
the Kits Racing team and uh, Andy Guy there saying that they've been looking at the possibility of new Kawasaki engines and so they have long since realised that they need to go to four strokes. They can't keep expecting the BRM two stroke to give them the anything like performance that they need to, to try and get up in the first three so the inevitability of needing to move to four stroke has reached now down to the, the kits racing team and so david james will be guiding them towards getting that but the first of all they've got to try and negotiate the budget the enormous amount of money that's required in order to, to invest in the first of all in the engine and then get the development get the thing slung in the chassis correctly and get it breathing and get it performing something like and able to get into the, the first three so uh, they've got a lot of work to do at the moment and at this stage of the season it begs the question are they going to be able to get the thing bought and paid for and set up right in time for Y2K or is it going to be investment for next year I think uh, the writing's on the wall there probably for next year I would yeah. think. wouldn't that make more sense <laughs> indeed <laughs> already up number 13 Paul Phillips uh, getting lapped there on the uh, slipstream racing Honda. That's not Ruth Laidlaw in the chair because she decided, Ruth decided that she needs the rest of the year to get her leg properly mended after that big pile-up in South Africa. And uh, this is a great battle going on as Klavenbach at the front begins to try and launch himself past the two Olympia recent Suzuki's. Steve Webster's has taken the lead, Steinhausen second, and I suspect that Klavenbach and Harney don't want to give Steve Webster any opportunity with that man Paul, that smiling happy man Paul Woodhead on board to pull out any sort of advantage. And Klavenbach goes for the inside but can't quite squeeze through, trying desperately to do an Ori Hager. Of course, if you hang the outside of these outfits out, you'd certainly need a plenty of room. This is a narrow circuit, even for the solos, so it's not, certainly not any wider for the three-wheelers. Steve Webster leads, York Steinhausen, Klaus Klaffenbach, Abbott, Janssen, Muldoon are the next guys up. Muldoon has almost caught, is about a second and a half down on Benny Janssen, so all the time, Paul Muldoon is making progress. I don't know whether he could possibly get onto the rostrum unless something happens to the guys ahead, but uh, he's showing he's got the pace. That OKM erotic machine def definitely, desperately wants to get through to second place. But uh, Cluffy, you're going to have to be later on the brakes, my boy, or even you're going to have to slipstream. Has he got the sheer power? And he has. As he went past us then, he just whipped past... But uh, has, has he made his move too soon? York Steinhausen tries to show up the inside. Clever boy, you can't stay that far out. Yes, you can. And cuts the nose ruthless, ruthlessly off. Klaus Klavenbock squeaks through into second place. And that means he can indeed take off after Webster. Unless, of course, York Steinhausen retaliates. Don't go away. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Klaus Klavenbach has just snatched the lead in this dramatic sidecar World Cup race here at Valencia in Spain. Paul Woodhead and Steve Webster get unceremoniously shoved aside. The 40-year-old Yorkshireman takes a long, hard look over his left shoulder and finds that his teammate York Steinhausen is now a good 100, 200 metres behind him. So no worries there right now. He can focus on the man in front. Steinhausen nearly three seconds off the lead. Klaffenbach with that 142.525 second lap has taken the lead. Webster did a 143.378. Steinhausen 143.3. Abbott 143.5. So those guys keeping up a terrific pace. And Paul Muldoon has moved through into fifth place. 15 and a half seconds behind the leader. But certainly the Clark Grand Prix guys, and there they are in the red and yellow outfit, are really this weekend and last weekend. And this in these uh, tighter, smaller tracks at Misano and Valencia finding the sort of oomph that they need and really coming into their own. Tom Hanks, the FTC Yamaha of Hanks Racing, hanging in there in seventh place. They've got a six-second lead on Dave Molyneux and Peter Hill. But certainly the Clark Grand Prix guys are moving up the ranks in terms of sheer speed. And here's Klaffenbach making his move on... Wow, and it was a very clean and very, very explosive move he made. There was no doubt in that one, Rob. And very impressive because uh, the Klaffenbach outfit has just pulled out and driven by both of the, the Steinhausen outfits coming on to out of turn 14 uh, when Klaffenbach moved from third up to second. Uh, he 
somewhat awkwardly came around the left-hander and very quickly up onto the back wheel of uh, Jörg Steinhausen and just wrenched the sidecar over to one side and drove straight by uh, Jörg Steinhausen and Christian Parts and didn't even need to use the slipstream effect. On um, that occasion when he went by Steve Webster, slipstreamed him a little tiny bit but pulled by there easily, no problems at all. So that uh, crafty warrior of Klaus Slavenbock, he does sandbag so much and waits to just zap you when you least expect it. The Clark Grand Prix guys, number six, 26-year-old Stuart Muldoon, 26-year-old Dipstick Gussman in the chair and they might just be on a faster slap claffy look at that 141.642 that's the new benchmark for sidecars around here but uh, Benny Janssen the uh, old war horse himself 1990 world motocross champion moved over on, into road racing two years later uh, he's the man who's on the move now and beginning to cut back on Muldoon and Gusman. Muldoon and Gusman, they better keep that momentum up because they might just have company pretty soon. Fifth and sixth place, Muldoon and Janssen battling it out and Tom Hanks hanging on very impressively. Remember, Hanks, a relative newcomer, had an encouraging result at Donington Park and suddenly decided to start coming to the World, the world uh, Sidecar Cup races and he's been very, very impressive. Steve Abbott's got his left hand up there. That is Jamie Biggs indicating that the 1050cc Yamaha engine or something has gone bump in the night and poor old Steve Abbott holding on to that fourth place but to no effect there's no smoke coming out of the back of the outfit which suggests that it hasn't, the motor hasn't blown that it's simply stopped and something has just given up the ghost well that's a big big shame there because Steve Abbott having lots of luck all of it bad this season and uh, came along here to Valencia and I was singing the praises of how well that outfit was holding fourth place but it's all gone sour for Steve Abbott so it's a long long drive back home with no points what a shame Steve Abbott goes out of the Valencia sidecar World Cup and uh, well Steve just make sure you come and give us a good show at Brands Hatch that's the boy well that's very disappointing always enjoy watching those guys in action Jamie Biggs there takes out his earplugs oh, it's alright mum he's still in one piece unlike uh, um, unlike his brother who uh, and dislocated a collarbone, uh, uh, dislocated a shoulder at Hockenheim, and the other brother, bless him, who had leg, in, leg injuries after crashing with Jeff Bell at Croft up in my native northeast. Uh, so I hope uh, Brother Biggs the third is feeling a bit better now and on the road to recovery. Meanwhile, at the front, on the road to winning at the moment, unless something goes deeply wrong, Klaus Klaffenbott beginning to pull away from world champion. Uh, world champion uh, half a dozen times over and that is Steve Webster with a lot of air underneath his sidecar wheel and uh, Benny Janssen the 42 well he, he just turned the Dutchman just turned 42 years old back on the 16th of this month and uh, he's the man who's challenging Muldoon at the moment Janssen is just six tenths of a second behind in that battle for what is now of course fourth place Steinhausen is trying to keep these guys in sight but not succeeding Steve Webster however is retaliating you can never get past Steve Webster and expect him to just go away. That's why he's been world champion so often. He is beginning to pick up his pace to actually stay somewhere near Klaffenbach and keep some sort of pressure on him. Well, Webbo into turn 14, the left-hander under the start, finish straight a little bit hot there. That uh, sidecar moved about two or three feet <laughs> to out to the right as Steve Webster threw it in there. Really not too much braking going on there. The way on many occasions as the sidecars slow themselves down, inverted commas, to get around a corner is just throw the thing sideways and let the laws of physics hopefully scrub off a little bit of speed. So Webbo is on the move. The man who originally, of course, became world champion in 1987 with Tony Hewitt in the chair three times in 87, 88 and 89. It's a bit like a where are you now? Where are you now, Tony Hewitt? What are you doing? Steve Webster won again with Gavin Simmons in 1991 and then returned after, of course, we'd had a double world championship for Darren Dixon and Andy Hetherington in 1995 and 96. And then the Sidecar World Cup took over and Webbo took over again with David James, 97, 98 and 99. Two hat-tricks. The OKM machine then, Suzuki engine, OKM machine of Klaus Klaverbott and Adolf Harney, the Austrian-Swiss combination, sliding gracefully along in the lead at the moment. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back to see if Benny Janssen can catch the Clark Grand Prix, guys. 
It was back in Spain at Albacete just 12 months ago that number 17 flying Dutchman Benny Janssen had a major collision that uh, damaged his passenger, Franz Gertz van Kessel, the man with whom he'd raced for over 20 years. And now with Trevor Hopkinson in the chair, the number 17 outfit of the former world sidecar motocross champion is right there challenging for fifth place against the Clark Grand Prix squad of Paul Muldoon and Chris Gussman and that beautiful blue Hanks Simmons outfit trying to hang on to the two of them but Benny Janssen 42 years young became national sidecar road racing champion in 1994 and again in 1995 in Holland and then was ninth in the world sidecar championship the world cup in 1998 and then dropped, uh, dropped of course to 17th because uh, he went out halfway through the season last year, but he's back, and so too is Webster. As they begin to get into the back markers, and the number 11 outfit of Paul Steenbergen and Rennie Steenbergen from Holland uh, get rapidly dispensed with, suddenly Klaffenbach has got Webster for company once again. He's a nuisance, this man from Easingwald, isn't he? If, he's, if, he's a, if you're his opposition, he just never goes away, Rob. Now that, that's got to be good news and it, it's to be expected as well. We've got five laps to go here and uh, these two arch rivals are slugging it out around this Valencia circuit and as we've said earlier on, you can count on the fact that either Steve Webster's going to come back at you or Klaus Klaffenbach's going to come back at you and uh, this is quite a, a narrow track so Steve Webster at the moment he's been able to catch up onto the back wheel of his arch rival, rival Klaus Klaffenbach but he's got to choose as we will remember back to Australia and Phillip Island he's got to choose his moment very carefully to get by and also the, <laughs> the, that's right and also the timing of that maneuver because as soon as Steve Webster shows a wheel and hopefully gets through safely without any collisions then you just know that Klaus Slavenbox is going to try and come back at him and uh, oh, oh the and number 11 lap the Steenbergens go out yeah but, uh, I hope they get they're getting themselves off the middle of the track or, or they're rejoining the track I think they probably over outbreak themselves trying to keep out of the way while it's being lapped and uh, I, I like the word carefully because uh, I thought the Philip Island performance was in fact one of the most wondrously careless pieces of overtaking <laughs> I'd ever seen as, uh, as it lobbed Adolf Harney somewhat contentiously out of the chair anyway Klavenbock now look at that 236.8 238.9 maximum speeds as they go screaming down into the first turn up the hill towards the Mick Doohan hairpin and this is Klaus Klavenbock versus Steve Webster once again. Episode 96 in a never-ending series of dashing adventures between, well, <laughs> England beat Germany at football last Saturday. Since when, Jörg Teuschert and Christian Kellner have been well and truly turning the tables in world super sports. And uh, here's Klaus Klavenbock attempting to... Um, right the wrong again here well that's certainly the Steenbergens haven't only just gone straight on they've obviously done a little bit of damage and they're certainly blowing a bit of oil out of that outfit now and I think very sensibly they're going to pull off that, that's not actually oil the, the, fact, the fact that that bodywork then was rubbing on the tyre ah, is causing right. it to, to uh, overheat and bone the tyre off the, the frustrating thing for the Steenbergens in is that they are technically in 11th place even though they, they're a lap down and so that's more than a, a few points if they can just keep going I think I'd have been tempted then Jack to rush around the front rip that bit of bodywork off and then carry on and get a few points you can't afford to come this far and go home with no points and very little prize money it's it's just too heartbreaking I, I couldn't face that possibility well we'll have to check whether or not they do manage to restart whether or not they were going to do a bit of um, a bit of uh bald handed ripping off a brutal <laughs> ripping apart shredding of the metal <laughs> or shredding of the fiberglass shredding of whatever these what are these shells made of well, other than that, there's a lot of carbon fiber in there if you can afford it or at least very very thin fiberglass but uh, something that mystifies me, you know, Jack, is that uh, Klaus Klaffenbach, when he made his, m his dramatic m manoeuvre up from third to take the race lead, he banged in on lap 13 a 1 minute 41.642. That's 0.3 of a second faster than Steve, Steve Webster's super pole, pole position. And now Klaff Klaffy is, relatively speaking, settled back into the high 142s and 143s. As Benny Janssen comes right alongside the Clark Grand Prix on the... Oh, and the Clark Grand Prix guys are blocked by a back marker. The number 14 outfit of Lachty, but he nevertheless swings across and grabs that bit of tarmac and says, thank you very much, I'll have that. Not letting you get past just yet. And uh, Gusman takes a long look over his shoulder just to check. And that number 14 outfit, Lachty must have wondered where they were coming from. 
He's in. And that was how the problem came about because we almost look at that. They were actually touching one another. The Clark Grand Prix guys, Muldoon went way wide as he tried to lap Lechty in a hurry. And suddenly he found himself clashing fairings with Benny Janssen. Don't mess with this man, he's a former motocrosser. <laughs> And this next outfit for the Hammer, number 15, the Van Giels outfit. Number 15, lying in ninth place. Martin and Tony Van Giels on the Janssen, uh, they, they're in a, a Janssen racing Suzuki. Part of the same squad, about to, they'll be getting lapped by the boss soon. The OKM outfit is still there, but he doesn't seem quite as clever going past. As soon as I say he's not quite as clever going past back mark as he whistles past the Van Giels. Steve Webster follows suit. Klaffenbock, all you can do, Klaffy, is keep winning. If they're going to strip you of 25 points, all you can do is keep, keep winning. So, like Norrie Hager, that's what he's uh, attempting to do while the FIM sort themselves out. Well, that little mystery I was talking about, Jack, where uh, Klaus Klaffenbock came by and did a 141.642 and then settled back in almost two seconds a lap slower. Uh, he has now fired up that uh, OKM machine, that Suzuki. He's giving it the berries now. Klaus Klaffenbock has dropped his lap time down to 142.057, so much, much faster. And Klaus Klaffenbock, as I say, with those two laps to go, he is now making the sprint for the, for the race win and uh, looking as though, at least at this stage of the race that Steve Webster hasn't got anything to reply at this point. I did promise you folks back uh, in British Eurosport land that I'd give you an update on that fuel injected Suzuki Hayabusa engine and talking with uh, Rolf Steinhausen, of course uh, Jörg Steinhausen's dad, Rolf Steinhausen, Steinhausen says at long last they are glad to release onto the track to unleash the power of that fuel injected machine which will be next week in a German championship race at the Nürburgring. So so that will be out on track for the first time, the, the, the fuel-injected Hayabusa engine. And uh, Rolf Steinhausen saying that if it's successful there, it may well come along to Brands Hatch and will be treated really, really to something unique. And, well, in old money, that's the first time ever <laughs> to see fuel injection coming into sidecar racing for the first time. So, fingers crossed. I don't know who's going to be driving the outfit at Nürburgring next week, but the outfit will be there on track for the very first time. Can't wait for the outcome of that and I'm sure that one person that will be able to uh, be waiting with great gusto to get out on that fuel injector machine will be in second place at the moment. Steve Webster would like that bit of extra drive because he's sick to death of Klaus Klaffenbach doing these last lap flings and beating him to the line perhaps. Higher booster fuel, inje fuel yeah. injected. They'd better just glue the leaves to the trees at Brands Hatch if that thing takes off round there. It's going to be incinerating a few a bit of the foliage, I should think. And uh, at the moment, Klaus Klaffenbach. Well, I'm, I must admit, I'm a, I'm a bit terrified of that because, gosh, if these guys get any more power, what are they going to do with it? At the moment, we have something closely resembling a close match. It would be nice if it uh, if it stayed something like that. Klaffenbach and Webster. They are still at it. Daylight once more under the Webster sidecar wheel as he pours it on through that left-hander. And uh, every time Klaus, I think, deliberately kicks up the dust, as if to say, there you are, just see you see through the, your way through that a bit, just a quick brown fog. And, uh, wow, look at Wheel that. spin from the, the back wheel there from Webbo. The rubber smoke from Webbo's rear end. How much power does the man need? But it's working. It's closed right back up, and he's going to be looking for a lead. We're on lap 22. Uh, we're on lap 23 of 23. I think we're on the last lap. We've got 22 laps completed. Webbo's going for the outside as we come down into the last turn. And Claverbock gets his head down. He's got to go for it. He's got to keep Webster behind him if he possibly can. Checkered flag goes out. Does it or does it not? No, nope, that was it. We had the finish line. I didn't even see the checkered flag, but uh, there we go. The uh, Adolf Hani is clapping Claffy around the shoulders to say, well done, sunshine. Hope you checked your fuel yesterday. <laughs> and look at this. Benny Janssen still hasn't made it past that obstinate man, Paul Muldoon. Muldoon and the Clark Grand Prix Honda are hanging on there in fourth place. Well, it's not over yet. The Teledyne Clark Grand Prix Honda dives down into the final turn. And Benny Janssen, bless his heart, not quite having made it after all that effort. Some real fairing, bashing stuff there going on for fourth and fifth place. Paul, Paul Muldoon takes it. Janssen is fifth. 
and I think Hanks is going to go across the line just hold off Dave Molyneux as they go past us now I thought for a moment that a hand went up in the Hanks outfit as if they might have been having some problem they were oh can you believe it Tom Hanks and Ian Simmons are having to run for the line and they're getting overtaken in the meantime Molyneux has gone across in sixth place oh can you believe that they must have run out of fuel it's or is it fire. on fire uh, hang, now hang on fellas what's more important yeah that's all very well if I were you I think I'd run for cover but obviously they desperately want to finish Ian Simmons risking his life now a standing passenger <laughs> and they're, up, they're asking for a mobile fire extinguisher Hanks is still in seventh place Ian Guy and Andy Peach haven't shown up yet it's a possibility that that, that that is the where the exhaust outlet into the air and there's so much heat from that if there's not a fire extinguisher soon this is not going to be a laughing matter just want to get the points first and the fire Put extinguisher the fire arrives and uh, oh a dramatic collapse there What's, uh, I think you'd be tied out to put, trying to push the outfit in 30 degrees of temperature. <laughs> <laughs> the guy is tired. Well, I, I think uh, I think he's probably saying, "Can we? Can I? Uh, can I retire again now, please? Can I go and play back at home, Mr. Hanks?" And it looks as if Tom Hanks and Ian Simmons aren't going to get any points. Unless, can they carry on pushing now? For goodness sake! All they've got to do is get across the line. Go on, mate. Keep going. You'll have to keep your helmet on, though. Otherwise, they'll say you've broken the rules. Come on, you can do it, Sunshine. He is going to have a bash as well. Oh, no, he can't. Oh, yes, they are going to push him over. Surely that's outside assistance. Is that allowed? I don't know. Well, they've both got cool hairdos. Keep pushing, boys. At the moment, Ian Guy's gone across the line in seventh place. Van Giels, remember, was lapped. So these guys, if they can make it to the finishing line, and they'd better beat their crash helmets on, if they can make it to the finishing line, then they'll get eighth place. They're just about there. The chequered flag is trying to encourage them. <laughs> Another dramatic collapse. Ian Simmons <laughs> falls all over the chair. His crash helmet lolls off his bald head. <laughs> oh, bless him. <laughs> so there it is. I come all this way to stand in for you. I suffer. All, I almost suffer incineration and then heat exhaustion. And we get eighth place for our troubles. Well, what a wonderful finish. Clavenbach, well, it was wonderful for us to watch. I'm sorry, Tom Hanks, I appreciate it. it wasn't the best of finishes for you. You should have been sixth. You ended up with eighth place. Clavenbach and Harney then, they win a fine race against Webster and Woodhead. Steinhausen and Parts are eventually 24.9 seconds adrift in third place. Muldoon, Gusman, who really were on the pace of the leaders for a lot of the time. And Webster did a 141.990 on his last lap. So uh, that was a pretty dramatic race. Ian Guy and uh, Andy Peach they finished in seventh place so that was the world cup sidecar pre-adm honda